sheep are stupid, right? Has not people said they're a stupid animal or whatever? People have said that. I'm not saying that they're stupid, you know, but they've been called that. And I don't know. Sometimes I've been stupid as a Christian. Uh, the confession time, sometimes I've done stupid things. I, I've just been, can I, am I all alone? Can I, get a, can I get somebody to join with me? Come on, great, thank you. Thank you. Stupid's a strong word, I guess. Um, sheep need to be led. And sheep don't always stay. Sheep always need a shepherd. Just concerned with so this morning, you know, we're at John 11. Ale I know Alexander's John 11 last week. I was going to tidy up John 11. Alexander says to me, what? You mean I didn't tidy it up? No, you didn't want to. Sorry. Hey, get it right now because we don't want that to happen in the rain. Right? That's right. But he'll, he'll flow with you too. He'll just... Um, so, uh, where was I? Yeah, John, we, the last time I think uh, I spoke on John was John 10. And John 10 and 11, yeah. And uh, it was about the Good Shepherd. And it says, I'm a Good Shepherd and the sheep hear my voice. So that means if you're a sheep, I didn't, I'll take it back, I didn't call you all stupid. If you're a sheep, that means we must be in a position, our very existence depends on hearing the voice of the shepherd. Romans, Paul says in Romans that we are led of the Spirit. God is always accepted. And I take this responsibility greatly, that if I'm an under-shepherd, if I'm a pastor, that means I have to come and deposit something that would cause you to hear the voice of God. And I think I was going to do the marvelous job last week. You know, I was in my office praying, just, I don't know if I was praying, just spending some quiet time, and I wrote in my journal before I came down here last Sunday, and I just felt the Lord was talking to me about waiting on God. And I wrote in my journal that, that God's going to be speaking to me about learning to wait on God. That's what I got out of the message. Alexander shared his Africa story and how, you know, you think that things aren't working out, you think things aren't going as they planned, and Lazarus was dead not three days, four days. And I'll tell you, God spoke to me about waiting on God. About waiting on Him. So I pray He speaks this morning, just as I'm not going to read all of John chapter 11, I just want to... This is what I had planned for John 11, or part of it, it works perfectly for me anyway, and coming to the communion table. John chapter 11, we will not read the whole thing, I had, we won't read, uh, we're just going to read two verses as a matter of fact. And in John chapter 11, verses 43 and 44, now most of us, I know most of you here, you know the story, Alexander took us through it last week, and even before that we know the, the story of Mary and Martha and Lazarus, two sisters and a brother, Jesus loved them. Jesus came, Lazarus was sick, the girls were saying, come on, let's go, and Jesus delayed. Waited two days, ultimately he gets there four days later, or he gets there however many days later, six days you said? Six days, he was dead for four days. He was dead for four days. Jesus wept, the shortest verse in the whole scripture, Jesus wept. And it was for God's glory. Things happen in our lives. Things happen in our lives, and the devil's to blame. Any Calvinists here? No? no. Things happen in our lives, and we can blame the devil. We have, a, we have an enemy who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That's what he comes to do. But God wants to lead us in life and life abundant. He wants us to be led in that path of righteousness. He wants us to know, surely goodness and mercy shall follow you all the days of your life. Though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, fear not. The devil's greatest end is when we fear. It is. So, for whatever reason, for whatever reason, all this went on. Jesus waited, and Jesus stalled, Jesus wept, he was hurt, he was grieved. But whatever happens in our lives, where we mess it up and it's trying to figure out how it happened, who to blame, or whatever, we just have to pray continually, the Lord be magnified. Regardless of what's going on in your life, the Lord be magnified. It's a good place to be. I can't figure this out, but the Lord be magnified. As Romans says, stay in the love of God. Keep in the love of God. 
Mary and Martha did that. Lazarus proved it later in his life. He obviously proved it before Jesus loved him. He was endeared to them. And he said, all this is happening is a big time to be glorified. But it's not just Lazarus' story. It's not just Mary and Martha's story. It's not just a story for that biblical day. It's not just a story that for our kids reading in the children's Bible. It's not just Lazarus' story. It's your story and it's my story. Um, we've got one word title, it's in, the, it's in the bulletin, come. And that's where I want to leave you this morning as we go to the communion table. I want this table to speak to all of us this morning, myself included. It's just come. Come to the table. As we prepare our hearts to come to the table, I want to just take you through the word of it. I want to share a couple of things with you. I want you to hear the voice of God calling you to come. Because Alexander, how Alexander so eloquently put it in his worship, in, in leading us in worship. Like, I mean, the gospel is so clear. Listen, I died. I lived. I walked. I was brutally, brutally killed, crucified for you. So remember this. As often as you come and take this bread, remember what I did for you. As often as you drink that cup, remember my blood spilled for you. Come. Come. But remember, for as often as you do this, you proclaim my death until I come. Come. I am risen from the dead. We've got to learn to hear his voice. I heard shame a few times in that, in that scripture. You know, I'm going to pick on these guys over back here because they've worked so hard on this soundboard. I don't know if you guys, Grant was here from 8 o'clock yesterday morning until 11 o'clock last night. No, not that late. And it, forgive us. Six or, oh, six or seven minutes. <laughs> these guys work hard back there. They do. They do. Now I was going to say, guys, let's get this soundboard. Let's get this soundboard fixed. So then when Randy comes, when he gets up there, he's got power to that mic right away. And if we can't get it right, shame on us. You ever had anybody say that to you? Shame on you. If you can't do this, shame on you. What a terrible term. Shame on you. But you know, most of us have had circumstances or situations or even voices say to us, shame on you. We do it to ourselves. We shame on ourselves. When you come to this table, he calls you to this table. He calls you without an ounce. He wants you to come without an ounce. He wants you to bring your shame and leave it at the table. This broken body, this blood, it took your shame. And when we can learn to get rid of that shame, when we can learn to squelch the voice of the enemy who lies to us continually, he what? What does Romans chap uh, Revelation chapter 11 say? This is our class. What did he pardon? He's a father of What does he do? He accuses us. Bring those accusations to the table and hear Jesus saying, Come, this, okay, you got that video already, uh, Ephraim? This is not how Jesus talks. This is not how he calls you. This is six minutes long, but you will enjoy it.
Has, has, has anyone ever, ever tried to, to bury you alive in a box? No. No, but truly thinking about it does make my life horrible. I mean, I can't go through tunnels or be in an elevator or in a house. Anything boxy. <laughs> so what, what you're saying is you're, you're claustrophobic. Uh, yes. Yes, that's it. <laughs> All right, well, uh, let's go, Catherine. I'm, uh, I'm going to uh, say two words to you right now. I, I want you to listen to them very, very carefully. Then I want you to take them out of the office with you and incorporate them in, into your life. Shall well, so I uh, write them down? Well, if, if it makes you comfortable, it's just two words. Most, you find most people can, uh, can remember. <laughs> okay. You ready? Yes. Okay, you're there. Jesus, he cried with a loud voice. He's standing in front of this tomb. 
Lazarus has been dead four days. He already started, the body had started, already started to decompose. And you know, the way they had no embalming back then, as we know it, what they did was they would just fit, uh, cover him with perfume. He'd be cake. They say he probably carried about 60 or 80 pounds of cake perfume and, and uh, the, um, the grave cloths. And Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. What's our word? Come. And when he had died, and he who had died came bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to him, Loose him and let him go. How does this relate to you and I? How does this connect to this video? How do you hear Jesus say come? How do we hear him? What do we do when we come to this table? Do we just come and we just do it every week or every month and just, you know, I, I try and make it colorful, <laughs> not colorful, but, I, you know, I try to make it significant and, and to cause it to mean something. This morning as we come, if you would just hear, you would hear those words. You would see, this is Alexander Lettuce and Music. In that song, Christ is risen from the dead. Come awake. I keep on messing it up and you come away. You just charm me and let me sing my song the way I want to sing. Come awake. Come awake. Christ has risen from the dead. Come. Come and proclaim the meaning of this table. His body broke, his blood shed for our freedom. And you know, where I, what I see from this particular verse is that it doesn't, who, who, you know, I know most of you, I know myself, it doesn't happen like that. Something happened when we're born again, where our eyes are enlightened and God has touched our lives. But so many, you know, who has regrets in their Christian walk? If you've, if you've been walking with the Lord for at least 10 years, who can look back and say, oh, I wish I had done things a little differently? 20 years. 30 years. Aren't you glad he's not finished with us yet? As the music team prayed back in the office before the service, is that when we're faithless, Paul said to Timothy, relax. God is faithful. He can't deny himself. Lamentation says his mercies are new. How often? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But I want to be changed as we sing, Victor leads us in that song, be changed, we proclaim, we're changed by the power of the blood. And you know, too often we hear God call our voice, or we think we hear him call our voice, and we think we hear him say this, stop it! Can I get a witness? Stop it! When he says, come. Come. Now, he said, he said it in a loud voice, come forth. I'm sure it was a gentle love. That word come is really interesting. It literally means like, I, I related it to uh, how when I'm walking the dog, walking Pippin. I'm walking, come on, come on. Come forth, it means, come forth. Come on, let's get going. Let's get going. There's only one other place in scripture where Jesus uses that exact Greek word for come. Go with me to Mark chapter as you're turning there, well, I'm all turning with you. Oops. Mark chapter 10, starting at verse 17. This is found in two other places in Scripture, in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. This is a story that they call the rich young ruler. Now, as he was going out on the road, one came running knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit to eternal life? So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother, and so on. And he answered and said to him, Teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. I believe him. I believe he did Jesus looked at him and said, oh, I'm sorry, then Jesus looked at him, loved him, and said to him, one thing you lack, 
Go your way, sell whatever you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross, and follow me. But he was sad, sad at this word, and went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that I've got to sell everything? I've heard of communities and churches where people take that literally, and that's what they do. They go and sell everything. And some people are called to sell everything. I have a friend of mine who sold everything, and right now he's got his family. We support them now monthly. Paul Miller, he's got a boat, the Emmanuel, on the uh, Caribbean, and takes Bibles and goods into Cuba every year. He sold everything. Not everybody's called to do that. But the scripture speaks to all of us. Literally, what it meant to Paul Miller, what it means to me as a pastor, what it means to elders, what it means to all of us, everybody within the sound of my voice. Here's what it means. Jesus says this. I have two words. Above all. That's what he says to all of us. Make me above all. I don't think I've ever shared this with you, but I wrote a poem in 2005. I wrote two poems. I wrote them both in 2005. Well, I wrote a few more, but I wrote a few more, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't share them with you. I don't think I've shared this one. I shared my one on control. But watch this one. I think I have it up there. After. It says, above all, from whom? I sit and wait for comfort. I hope it's God alone. But thoughts still rage against to keep from knowing home. Home? A place for Christ to dwell. To fill and bring us peace. To look and say, I'm here. You're mine. Except release. Release from yesterday's, today's, tomorrow's. Their lies, controls, and fears. To whom? To him whose name is mercy, who looks with eyes of love to know his risen power. Let nothing rise above. And that's the word of Jesus to the rich young ruler, which is the same to you and I today. He said, let nothing rise above. No man, no woman, no career, no nothing. There's nothing wrong with men and women and careers and businesses and, and trips and retirements and all these things. Not, let nothing rise above. So we're not all young, rich rulers. We don't have all, God, I'd love to give, some of these could kids sit here, Lord, Lord, I'd love to give it all to you. Here, here's my bank's address. Go see them. <laughs> I'll give you all my debts. Let nothing rise above. And he doesn't say it in that tone of, no, 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 no. He's, no. Listen, I have much more. I have life. I have everything. Everything you need. Yes, eternal life, the ultimate. Forgiveness of sin. But I have life for you now. I want to lead you as a shepherd leads the sheep. Come. Come in shame, regret, fear, mistakes. Pride, keep us from coming. But he says, come, come forth. And we're like Lazarus. We come up, look at, he said to the people, and this is the job of the church. This is the calling of the church in one another. He said, go and lose him. We're to be that for one another. That's what the Holy Spirit does. That's what we're doing. Being confident, Paul says, that what's begun in us is being completed. What is? We're getting rid of more grave blows. Who still carries grave clothes? That would be the old man. That would be our sinful nature. I'll tell you, there's a teaching out there now. There's a, a hyper message of grace in Christendom today. Where people don't believe that we have grave clothes. I'm telling you, and if this disappoints you, I battle with grave clothes. I battle with a little bit of dung in the bottom of my feet. <laughs> What's that snake? <laughs> but when we can hear the voice of God saying, come. You know, there is a key, um, bear with me here just for a second, as we uh, come to the table. I won't say it. Yep. Here we go. I'm learning on this uh, iPad. Basically, my paraphrase for what Jesus said here to the uh, rich young ruler, he said this, and I'm kind of combining, well, if you look, look again one more, uh, verse 
21, then Jesus looking at him, this is key, this is very key, and I don't know if all, I don't know if all the verses from all three Gospels say this, this one does. Then Jesus looking at him, and sometimes we can miss this, and we just, we don't recognize it. Jesus looking at him, I know you're saying, Rick, get to it, but this is very important, don't miss this. Jesus looking at him, loved him. Isn't that so easy to skim over and not reckon? Jesus looking at him, he was calling him to a high place. He was calling to a pl him to a place that was nothing was to rise above. He was calling for his all, but he loved him. Then Jesus looking at him, loved him. How? He loved him with his eyes. It had to have been. It says, Jesus looking at him, loved him, and said to him, one thing you lack. He said, come, this is my paraphrase, come, come out, come on. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said one thing. He said, me, above all, come, follow me. Me, come, me, above all, and follow me. And so, it's, I don't know, I didn't study this in depth, but I find it really strange that only the Old King James and the New King James add, take up the cross. The NIV, I think the Amplified Judy doesn't even say take up the cross, doesn't it? There must be a reason for it. I don't know why. They must be blind. <laughs> but no, I, don't, I can't find a translation. I didn't look at all of them. They, they don't say, but Christ is risen from the dead. Come, take up the cross. There's a price to pay. Take up your cross and follow me. But he looks with eyes of love. This is a table of love. The Gospel of John says, what man or a man who would give up his life for his friends? Father, we recognize here this morning through your word, and through the music, and through the fellowship with each other, through the power of your word, through the worship that we sang, the power of your word spoken and preached, the power of your word through song, through the heart of one West King, Lord, that there is a little Lazarus in all of us. We're told every day to put on not just our armor, Put on the new man. Put on that new man. Can't do it. And I pray that you would continue to open the eyes of all of our hearts and cause us to see that you do not say shame on you. You call us, Lord. And you say, come. You look at us with eyes of love, regardless of what you see. And you say, come. Show us your ways. Teach us your paths. Lead us in your truth. Teach us, Lord. Heal us. Help us. Enlarge our lives with faith and hope that you truly are alive. Work in all of our lives.